welcome to the Shelly Studio. Today I'm working on my 100 day project. It's getting so close to the end. <laughs> so close. Started in February and now we're in May. And I would tell you what number, but I can't remember. But, but it's close. I can just say that. <laughs> so I am in the browns. I'm actually just finishing up the brown. Um... And then we'll be moving on to the next color, which is black. The last one. <laughs> um, so I have one last story in the brown. And the color is mummy. Can you believe that? That's really a color. So on July 30th, 1904, O'Hare and Hoare placed an unusual advertisement in the Daily Mail. What they wanted, at a suitable price, was an Egyptian mummy. It may appear strange to you, the notice read, but we require our mummy for making color. Then, to stave off any pricks of public conscience, they continued, surely a 2,000-year-old mummy of an Egyptian monarch may be used for adorning a noble fresco in Westminster Hall or elsewhere without giving offense to the ghost of the departed gentleman or his descendants. <laughs> By then, such a plea was unusual enough to raise comment, but mummies had been dug up and reused in various ways for centuries without much fuss. Mummification had been common burial practice in Egypt for over 3,000 years. The internal organs were removed before the body was washed and embalmed using Complex mixture, mixtures of spices as well as preservatives, including beeswax, resins, asphalt, and sawdust. Although mummies, particularly those of the rich and distinguished, whose wrappings were likely to king, contain gold and trinkets, could be valuable in themselves, those who dug them up were more often after something else. Bitumen. The Persian word for bitumen was mum or mamiya which had led to the belief, along with the fact that mummified remains were very dark, that all mummies contained the substance bitumen. And by extension, mummies had been used as a medicine from the 1st century AD. Ground-up mummy, or mamia, was applied topically or mixed into drinks to swallow. And it seemed there was almost nothing it could not cure. Pliny recommended it as toothpaste, Francis Bacon for the stanching of blood, Robert Boyle for bruises, and John Hall, Shakespeare's son-in-law, used it on a troubling case of epilepsy. Catherine de' Medici was a devotee, as was Francois I of France, <coughs> pardon my cough, who carried a little pouch of powdered mummy and rhubarb on him at all times. Trade was brisk. John Sanderson, an agent for an importer called the Turkey Company, vividly described an expedition to a mummy pit in 1586. We were let down by ropes, as into a well, with wax candles burning our hands, and so walked up upon the bodies of all sorts and sizes, they gave no noise and smell at all. I broke off all the parts of the bodies to see how the flesh was turned to drudge and brought home diverse heads, hands, arms, and feet. Oh my gosh. <laughs> ah, Mr. Sandinson actually returned to England with one complete mummy and 600 pounds of sundry parts to refresh the supplies of the London apothecaries. Demand, however, outpaced supply, and there were numerous reports of replacements being hastily made from bodies of slaves and criminals, while on a visit to Alexandria in 1564, the physician to the king of Navarre interviewed one mummy dealer who showed him 40 he claimed to have manufactured himself in the past four years. Because apothecaries often dealt in pigments, too, it is not so surprising that the rich brown powder also found itself in painter's palettes. Mummy, also known as Egyptian brown, and caput mortem, dead man's head, was used as paint, 
usually mixed with a drying oil and amber varnish, from the 12th until the 20th centuries. It is well known enough for an artist shop in Paris to call itself tongue, presumably in cheek, a la mummy. <laughs> Gradually, though, toward the end of the 19th century, fresh supplies of mummies, authentic or otherwise, dwindled. Artists were becoming dissatisfied with the pigment's permanency and finish, not to mention more squeamish about its provenance. The pre-Raphaelite painter Edward Bourne Jones hadn't realized the connection between mummy brown and real mummies until one Sunday lunch in 1881, when a friend re related having just seen one ground up at a colorman's warehouse. Born Jones was so horrified he rushed to his studio to find his tube of Mummy Brown and insisted on giving it a decent burial then and there. And the scene made a great impression on the teenage Rudyard Clip Kipling, Born Jones' nephew by marriage, who was also a guest at lunch. To this day, he wrote years later, I could drive a spade within a foot of where that tube lies. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So that that's the end of brown. And as you can see, I'm on to the black. <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed that story. That is from the book, The Secret Lives of Color by Cassia St. Clair. Um, that's where my inspiration for my 100 day challenge came from. Uh, the book is in the description box. The link to it is in the description box below in case you're interested. No pressure. It is an Amazon affiliate link, so, you know, I get a few pennies if, if I sell something out of my Amazon affiliate link, and I just have to make you aware of that. <laughs> All right, so on to the black. Now, black, the colors that are in this chapter are coal, Payne's gray, obsidian, ink, charcoal, jet, melanin, and pitch black. Um, in 1946, Gallery Mitt, an avant-garde Parisian gallery on the Rue de Banc on the left bank, staged an ex exhibition called Black is a Color. <laughs> it was a statement intended to shock. This was the precise opposite of what was then taught in art schools. Because black is the what, like, black and white are not colors in one sense. This is right, like white. Black is an expression of light. In this case, it's absence. True black would reflect no white light whatsoever. The opposite of white, which reflects all light wavelengths equally. On an emotional level, this has not affected our experience or use of black as color. Payne's gray, one of my favorites. <laughs> In fact, some of those grays there look kind of blue, don't they? And I did, I did cheat. I added a little gold ring on there because um, I just liked it. <laughs> so here are the first four. The last two of the brown and the first two of the black. So there'll be ten, not in this video, but um, ten of each color. So there's two. And then I've got four more blacks coming. And um, I was reading in here and they talk about Vanta Black. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. Um, it's a carbon nanotube technology created in Britain in 2014. It traps 99.965% of the spectrum, making it the blackest thing in the world. In person, it is so dark it fools the eyes and brain, rendering people unable to perceive depth and texture. Now, isn't there a paint, like an expensive paint out there now um, that claims that? Maybe that's using the same technology? Um, I was trying to remember what it was called. I just cheated and looked it up. <laughs> it's sold by Culture Hustle, and it's um, the blackest acrylic paint in the world, Black 3.0. It's by... Um, Store it simple. If you go to um, 
Culture Hustle's website, it says, this may not be Venta Black, but it's pretty black. <laughs> I thought that was funny that it actually um, talked about Vanta Black in there. If I can find it on Amazon, I will put a link down below because, yeah, it is really expensive though. So only if you really, really want um, the blackest acrylic paint in the world. I will also try and list all the black and gray, because I use gray, um, paints that I um, use in my black period. <laughs> Um, they'll be in the description box below as well. If I can remember all the colors, all the paints I used. Um, so the next color, black, is coal. And that's K-O-H-L. And it, um, lurking in the Egypt Egyptology section of the Louvre in Paris is a curious object. It is a squat, sparkling white statuette of a bull-legged creature whose red tongue lolls from a mouth lined with sharp teeth. It has pendulous triangular breasts, a fierce blue V for eyebrows, and a long shaft of a tail that dangles rudely between its legs. Made between 1400 and 1300 BC, it depicts the god Bess who, while he may look terrifying, was actually rather sweet. A fearsome fighter, he was popular with ordinary Egyptians because he was a protector, particularly of homes, women, and children. What he was protecting in this case, though, was rather different. Hidden in the statue's hollow head is a small container intended for coal eyeliner. Pots like these turn up in a lot of museum collections because everyone in ancient Egypt, from pharaohs to peasants, male and female, rimmed their eyes with thick black lines. Many were buried with jars of coal so that they continu could continue to do so in the afterlife. In 2010, French researchers analyzing the traces of powder found in coal pots discovered that they also contained something even more precious man-made chemicals, including two kinds of lead chlorides that would have taken around a month to brew. Mystified, they conducted further tests. To their astonishment, these chemicals were found to stimulate the skin around the eye to produce around 240% more nitric oxide than usual, significantly reducing the risks of eye infections. In a time before antibiotics, such simple infections could easily lead to cataracts or blindness. Coal, like the little pot in the shape of a fearsome bess, was a very practical form of protection. Now, isn't that in that finally something that's like beneficial and not like deadly <laughs> on contact? If you've watched my other videos, you know what I'm talking about. And I hope you've been enjoying these videos. If you had have, let me know. Um, I've got a couple more to go before we're done, um, but it's, it's like I said at the beginning, it's getting close. Um, I'll, I'll tell you more black in the next video, um, but I think, I think stories are done for today. Um, have you been liking, like, those of you who have been following along, do you like this, me reading the book? Um, I don't know, I found the story is very interesting. I don't know that I could do that going forward, but it's been kind of fun in my opinion. So I'm just taking, like I didn't talk about anything I did up to this point, but I'm taking um, papers I've printed with onto tissue paper and deli paper and wax paper. And so they are at varying levels of opacity and transparency. And just collaging them down, hopefully, to make things interesting. I actually really like how, I, I think, because I I love blue, that I really like how the blacks turned out. 
um, partially because they're black and partially because that gray looks blue. Um, yeah, and I can't remember which one that is, but yeah, I'll figure it out. <laughs> And I do, and these are just random bits already in my collection of pieces of paper with marks on them. I keep using them. One of these, I haven't made any more. One of these days, I'm going to have to do either do a stash building video or I'm going to run out <laughs> of all the fun little collage papers. But I hope you've been enjoying this, these videos, this series. If you have, will you please let me know? Um, I appreciate um, your feedback. And I, I'm hoping to recreate one of these into a larger piece um, of the whole 100. So if you have a favorite, let me know what it is. Um, if you want to see just pictures of everything, they are on my Instagram page. And so you can, um, you'll find the, my Instagram link in the description box. I believe that's where it is. And, um, you could just go there and take a look and tell me which one you would do. And I don't know, you might want to wait till the end because that is six. That makes six. Black, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have four more left. All right. So the next video will be a shorter one because I only have four to make, I think. If I'm doing my math correctly. <laughs> uh, and here's my favorite part, the reveal. Taking the tape off. Of course, sometimes you have to doctor things. Had a few little smudge out spots there. Just take some paint. I'll probably have to do multiple coats to get it really white. But for now, that's what it is. So here we are at the end of this one. I have some pictures, of course, at the end here. I want to thank you all for watching. Um, I, like I said, I hope you're enjoying it. And I hope you have an awesome day.